Hi, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Bradley, an oculoplastic surgeon here at the Mayo Clinic, and I'm here today to talk to you about our recent efforts in facial reanimation. Here at Mayo Clinic, we have an interest in taking care of patients with facial nerve disorders through our facial reanimation clinic. This is a multidisciplinary clinic led by Dr. Samir Mardini in plastic surgery and with representatives from ophthalmology, neurology, and physical medicine and rehabilitation. We take care of all ages of patients with facial nerve disorders, including children with congenital facial nerve palsy and adults with both acute and long-standing facial nerve palsy. We also take care of patients who have aberrant regeneration after facial nerve palsy, manifesting as synkinesis or unwanted facial movements. In addition, we take care of patients with related cranial neuropathies, such as patients with cranial nerve 5 disorders, which manifest as neurotrophic keratopathy shown here. Nearly all of our patients benefit from supportive care, including the use of artificial tears or gel, tranquilizer, other nighttime shield, and punctal plugs. And many patients are also using contact lenses, either high water content soft lenses or scleral lenses. We often employ Botox in patients with synkinesis, and we also can use it in patients with facial nerve palsy to treat the contralateral face to improve symmetry. Botox, however, offers a temporary solution and needs to be injected every three to nine months. This composite slide shows a patient treated with Botox for synkinesis. On the top, we see him in repose and with pursing of the lips before Botox treatment. And on the bottom, we see him again in repose and with pursing of the lips with less closing of the eyelid after Botox treatment. So what are the surgical treatments that we have available for patients with facial nerve disorders? We have a variety of treatments. With any of them, the goal is to achieve a more symmetric appearance at rest and in motion. We have static versus dynamic options. And in choosing the correct procedure for an individual patient, the issues to be considered include the patient's goals, patient age, the cause of facial paralysis and its duration, and patient comorbidities. This slide highlights some of the static options available. They include brow ptosis repair, upper eyelid blepharoplasty, upper eyelid weight, lateral canthopexy, lower eyelid retractor release, lower eyelid spacer graft, lower eyelid tendon sling, fascial sling, and temporalis transfer. This slide shows an elderly patient before and after static surgery, including brow ptosis repair, blepharoplasty, lateral canthopexy, platinum weight, and temporalis transfer. And you can see the improvement in the overall symmetry of the face, particularly the brow, lower lid, and mid face. This case highlights some of our efforts in treating lower lid retraction due to facial nerve palsy. The patient was a 48-year-old gentleman who had undergone resection of a pilocytic astrocytoma in 1999. He had cranial nerves 5 and 7 involved. He was wearing a scleral lens, but it was tending to be decentered inferiorly, and he had long-standing lower eyelid retraction with paralytic lag ophthalmos. The surgical plan for this patient was to perform a left mid-face lift, as well as a palmaris longest tendon sling to the left lower eyelid, with a hard palate graft to the left lower eyelid, and left canthopexy. This slide shows the template used for the hard palate graft harvest. And here we have incised the conjunctiva and recessed the conjunctiva and lower lid retractors to prepare the bed for the hard palate graft placement in the gap in the posterior lamella. After that, the palmaris longus tendon is harvested from the wrist. We're able to preserve approximately half of the tendon, and we take a nine centimeter piece of the tendon. This is wrapped around the medial canthal tendon and then tunneled subcutaneously deep to the skin and the orbicularis in the pretarsal plane, and then it exits laterally, and at that location it is drilled into the lateral orbital rim to vertically suspend the lower eyelid. And here we see the patient preoperatively and postoperatively after the palmaris longus tendon sling. Another eyelid procedure that can be helpful on these patients who've undergone previous gold weight placement where the gold weight is visible because of its pretarsal location is to move the gold weight to a supratarsal location as seen in the lower panel here. And this slide shows preoperatively versus postoperatively after the supratarsal weight placement that we still obtain good closure but with a cosmetically better appearance of the eyelid. What are our options for dynamic facial reanimation? There are several principles that guide dynamic restoration of facial nerve function. First, we need to have a functioning nerve and muscle for facial movement. 
Second, facial muscles can respond to nerve grafting if they have been denervated for less than one year, and other muscle can be transferred in to substitute for non-functioning facial muscles. In addition, the contralateral facial nerve offers the best chance for spontaneous coordinated facial movement. This is typically obtained through cross-face nerve grafting. Cross-face nerve grafts require 8 to 12 months to become functional, and nearby functioning nerves can babysit facial muscles or transferred muscles to prevent denervation. The sources of muscle and nerve for dynamic restoration of facial nerve function include both regional and distant sites. The muscle sites include the temporalis muscle or the gracilis muscle used as a free flap. For the nerves, regionally we can use the masseteric nerve or the hypoglossal nerve, and distally we can use the sural nerve. This patient illustrates our efforts in dynamic facial reanimation. In December 2012, the patient presented to the Mayo Clinic following resection and radiation for astrocytic pilocytoma. We outlined a treatment plan to include a babysitter procedure from cranial nerves 5 and 12 to the distal branches of cranial nerve 7, as well as cross-face nerve grafting, right lower eyelid retraction repair, strabismus surgery, and fitting with a scleral lens. Here's the patient's appearance preoperatively and four months following babysitter procedure, cross-face nerve grafting, and one month following strabismus surgery. And we can see in the postoperative photograph that in addition to the eyes being aligned, the lower eyelid retraction has improved and the patient is starting to have the return of a nasolabial fold. Two months later, the appearance continues to improve with strengthening of the nasolabial fold and overall improvement in the symmetry of the lower face. In summary, static and dynamic options are available to manage facial nerve disorders. Facial nerve disorders are well suited to a team approach to patient care, and several options are available to address paralytic lag ophthalmos. These include use of a palmaris tendon sling to the lower eyelid and supratarsal gold weight placement for the upper eyelid. Finally, to refer patients with facial nerve disorders, you can contact us through the phone numbers listed there. Once again, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Bradley, oculoplastic surgery here at Mayo Clinic, and we've been talking about facial reanimation surgery. Thanks very much for your attention.